Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Total Organic Chemistry. This video, we're going to be taking a look at nucleophilic aromatic substitution and benzyne intermediates. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer for yourself are how do I add a nucleophile to an aromatic ring? How do I synthesize phenols? What is a benzyne intermediate? And what are some issues in regioselectivity that we encounter in benzyne chemistry? If you need some review on the more basic electrophilic aromatic substitution, please go ahead and watch that video at the top of the screen before continuing on this video. Let's start with that question that I posed a little bit ago. How do I synthesize phenols? So if we start with just benzene, our model six-membered aromatic ring, and we want to synthesize phenol, which is, remember, just benzene with a hydroxyl group on one of these carbons. If we're thinking within the realm of electrophilic aromatic substitution, which is all we know up to this point, we might need to generate an electrophile like OH+, and that electrophile would substitute one of the hydrogens on the benzene ring. However, we don't know of any reagent that can give us the equivalent of an OH plus electrophile, and this is very difficult to generate, so we actually aren't going to be able to perform an electrophilic aromatic substitution to form the phenol product. So we need to find a different way to accomplish this. Let's consider this slightly more complicated substituted benzene ring. We're going to have a chlorine on this carbon up here, and then two nitro groups arranged ortho and para to that chlorine. And if we treat this compound with aqueous sodium hydroxide and heat this up, we can produce the following compound, where we've replaced the chlorine with a hydroxyl group, and we still have these two nitro groups on the ring. So this is our introduction to nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Remember that OH- from the hydroxide is a very good nucleophile. We've encountered it many times before in other reactions. And we're using it here as a nucleophile to substitute that chlorine, which is our leaving group, on the aromatic ring. So what is the mechanism for this? Well, as always, we start with our starting material. We have the chlorine and the two nitro groups, again, ortho and para to the chlorine. And we will also have our nucleophile, so that's the hydroxide anion, come in, and the electrons on that oxygen will attack the carbon bearing the chlorine atom here. At the same time, one of the pairs of electrons in the aromatic ring will swing up to the adjacent carbon right here. That is the ortho carbon. So because the nucleophile in this case is attacking the same carbon, as the leaving group, we call this an ipso substitution. Ipso means the same carbon. So this will give us this next intermediate, where we now have the ring again, with now both a chlorine and hydroxide on the carbon up top here. And again, we have both of our nitro groups. I will draw this nitro group on the right-hand side fully in its Lewis structure. So we will have the nitrogen two oxygens and one double bond to one of those oxygens. Remember we have a positive formal charge on the nitrogen and a negative formal charge on that oxygen with a single bond. And we have this negative charge on the carbon bearing that nitrogen. So one thing that can happen here is that negative charge on this carbon can be delocalized into the nitro group. So we can draw the electrons swinging up to that nitrogen to form a double bond and then one of the electron pairs in the nitrogen-oxygen double bond swinging up to the oxygen. And that will give us this resonance structure, where we have still all of our substituents on that benzene ring. And now we have the negative charge delocalized up into the nitro group. So we have both oxygens carrying a negative formal charge, and the nitrogen still with a positive formal charge. We could further repeat this if we wanted to. I'm not going to draw out the structure but you could try to delocalize the electrons again into the other nitro group throughout the ring. The other thing that can happen with that negative charge on the carbon is it can swing back down into the ring to restore aromaticity, 
and it can kick off that chlorine as a leaving group. So the chlorine will break its bond to the carbon and leave, leaving us with the final product, where we still have both nitro groups on the ring, but we've replaced that chlorine with a hydroxyl group, which was our nucleophile. So why did I include both of these nitro groups here on this molecule? Well, it turns out that nucleophilic aromatic substitution in this reaction requires two or more very strongly electron withdrawing groups on the ring, arranged ortho or para to your leaving group. And these electron withdrawing substituents are necessary because they delocalize that negative charge that's produced during the reaction and allow that nucleophilic substitution to occur. We can take a look at another nucleophile as well. So let's start with the same starting material here with the chlorine on the top carbon and those two nitro groups, ortho and para to the chlorine. And if we treat this with ammonia and again heat the reaction up, we can undergo the same nucleophilic substitution reaction but instead of getting the phenol compound, where we had the hydroxide as the nucleophile, we will get this aniline, where we have the NH2 group on the ring, and that is from the ammonia acting as our nucleophile. And I'll leave it up to you to draw the mechanism for yourself, and show that ammonia can also act as our nucleophile. Okay, so what happens if we don't have these really strongly electron withdrawing groups on the ring, and we still want to perform a nucleophilic substitution? Well, let's imagine this starting material. We just have chlorobenzene. And again, if we treat this compound with sodium hydroxide in water at very, very high temperature and high pressure, we can actually produce phenol, so substituting that chlorine for a hydroxyl group on the aromatic ring. And before we look at the mechanism, Let's do one more reaction as well. We will take para-chlorotoluene, so that means we have a chlorine and a methyl group arranged para to each other on the ring. And we can treat this with potassium amide, that's KNH2. So we have the NH2 minus anion as our nucleophile. And we're going to be doing this in liquid ammonia. And you might imagine we'll get this product where we have simply substituted the chlorine for that NH2 group. We still have the NH2 and the CH3 para to each other. But we will also get quite a bit of the meta product, where we have the NH2 and the methyl group arranged meta on the ring. So this might be interesting. We haven't just substituted the chlorine. There is something else going on here. So let's examine and see what that is. So if we consider this starting material with the chlorine and the methyl group arranged para, I'm also going to draw in this hydrogen next to the chlorine here. We'll see why in a minute. And then we will have our amide anion come in as our nucleophile, like I mentioned. And because the NH2 minus anion is a very strong base, it's going to abstract this proton from the ring, and the electrons in that bond will swing down to give us this intermediate, where we still have our chloro and our methyl groups, but we now have a lone pair on the carbon that is ortho to the chlorine. Now this lone pair really doesn't like to be in the ring, it's going to be very unstable, so the electrons in that lone pair will come down to form a triple bond between these two carbons on the ring, and that will kick off the chlorine in the same step. So the chlorine will be our leaving group, and we will end up with our key intermediate called benzene. And this is called benzene because we have a triple bond in the benzene ring. So as you might imagine, triple bonds like to be in a linear geometry, so this is going to be very strained. And that triple bond really wants to open up and restore aromaticity in the ring. It wants to reform that double bond from earlier. So we can take our nucleophile now, our NH2 minus, and it can attack either carbon of this strained triple bond in the benzene intermediate. 
So because it can attack either of these carbons, that's where we get the issues in regioselectivity. So we will end up with a mixture of isomers. For now, let's choose the position that is para to the methyl group. We will have the electrons in the amide come in and attack that carbon. And one of the electron pairs in the triple bond will come over to form a lone pair on the adjacent carbon. Now we'll give us this next intermediate, where we now have the NH2 group bonded to the ring. We have restored aromaticity, so now we have our aromatic ring reformed. And we also have that negative formal charge on the adjacent carbon. We need to get back that hydrogen that we lost earlier, so now we can have perhaps a molecule of ammonia come in, and the lone pair here will abstract that hydrogen from the ammonia, and that will regenerate one equivalent of the amide anion, and also give us our product, or at least one of our products, which is the paramethylanilin. Remember, we will also get the metamethylanilin if we attacked that benzyne from the other carbon of the triple bond. So far, we've talked about two different ways to produce phenols from benzene. Let's look at one last way to do that. If we start with a general halobenzene, so I can draw this X here, that can be something like chlorine or bromine. And then we treat this with potassium hydroxide and a palladium zero catalyst. There are lots of ways to do this, but one common catalyst is the tetrakis triphenylphosphine palladium zero compound. And that just means we have four of these triphenylphosphine ligands around that palladium center. And then we heat this up. We can undergo a substitution and produce the phenol from this halobenzene. I'm going to lead you through a very abbreviated mechanism for this. However, it is very similar to palladium catalyzed cross couplings like the Heck reaction or the Suzuki coupling. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and click the video at the top of the screen for a look into those reactions. So this is going to be a cyclic mechanism here. We start with our palladium zero catalyst. And because there's so many, I'm just going to write palladium zero here. It doesn't really matter what the ligands are. We will have our halo benzene come in and undergo oxidative addition with the palladium. So that's going to oxidize the palladium to palladium two. And it will also insert itself between the benzene ring and our halide. Then we will undergo a transmetallation or a ligand exchange here where our potassium hydroxide will come in and become exchanged with that halide. So now we have this intermediate with the palladium 2 between the benzene ring and the OH. And finally, we have a reductive elimination step where we lose a molecule of our product, that's the phenol, and we've reduced the palladium 2 back to palladium 0. So it is a true catalyst in this sense. One interesting thing to note about this reaction is that you can use some alkoxides or amines instead of hydroxide, and those are very useful to form the respective phenyl ethers or phenyl amines in addition to just the phenols. So I hope this video helped you understand some nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions and some different ways that we can use them to our advantage to synthesize compounds that we haven't been able to synthesize up to this point. If you like this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on social media, and please remember I have a Patreon. If you're willing and able, consider donating to keep this channel going and help me continue creating all this content for you. Thanks for watching.